it really does. I mean, so much has changed. Uh, I published my, my first really big book on this subject 20 years ago, and that was Fingerprints of the Gods, which was published in 1995. And it said the basic, the takeaway message is that there was a global cataclysm between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago, and that a former high civilization had been wiped out in that cataclysm and is now remembered only in myths and traditions. And at the time, the archaeological community and their buddies in the media, uh, you know, poured scorn upon this book right. and, and, and attacked it from all directions, many of the directions being ad hominem attacks on me as an individual rather than on the ideas being presented seems like just anything possible was done to discredit the notion of a lost civilization but in the 20 years that have passed the evidence has moved very strongly in my direction we now have absolutely cut and dried scientific evidence and this is not you know woo woo stuff this is from mainstream scientists publishing in major peer reviewed journals like the proceedings of the national academy of sciences this information has not much got out into the public domain yet it's in the rarefied atmosphere of scientific journals but it presents compelling evidence for a global cataclysm exactly in the window that I proposed in 1995, between 13,000 and 12,000 uh, years ago. And this cataclysm resulted from the impact of several fragments of uh, a giant comet, which broke up into fragments, as, as comets do. Several of those fragments hit the Earth 12,800 years ago and caused a global cataclysm of flood and fire and rapidly rising sea levels. And then again... Uh, 1,200 years later, 11,600 years ago, there was a second series of impacts, this time in an ocean. We believe it was the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and this was accompanied by yet more uh, traumatic events, more global flooding and, and more disasters. And the 1,200 years between then between the first events 12,800 years ago and the second events 11,600 years ago, those 1,200 years ago were 1,200 years of absolute hell on earth <laughs> with a, a, a huge plunge in temperatures and massive ex extinctions of animal species. And that's when I believe we lost a whole civilization from the record. And then in addition, something else is that we now have archeological sites uh, that are popping up previously undiscovered, which date back to that epoch and which contain extraordinarily advanced workmanship, which cannot be explained by the existing model of history. And if I may just run on a little bit, the third and final thing is that the attitude of the public towards authority figures has also changed in the last 20 years. 20 years ago, uh, if Professor X or Dr. Y stood up and said uh, Hancock is talking rubbish, then the public listened. But 20 years later, now today, we have been lied to so often by authority figures, whether they're academics, whether they're big corporations, whether they're governments, whether they're religious figures, we've been lied to so often by them that there is rightly and properly a deep skepticism towards argument from authority. If an individual says, I have the authority and I just know what the facts are, people don't believe that anymore. And that's healthy. Yeah, amen, man. I mean, the communication channels are open. And to uh, quote the book, you say, I'm no conspiracy theorist, but I have a sneaking feeling, nothing more, that something a bit like a conspiracy is at work in science to prevent the proper consideration and wide public uptake of catastrophic ideas. Why is that? What's the danger in exploring these ideas? Yes, it's very peculiar. I go into this in, in some depth in the book because I think NASA in particular um, which has, you know, is charged with the responsibility and, and is the recipient of large amounts of public money, is charged with the responsibility of understanding our cosmic environment. NASA um, is very uh, misleading on the issue of the dangers that surround us in our cosmic environment. Um, it gives the impression, um, you know, that, that there is no real danger to the Earth from comets or asteroids, and that if there is a danger, it's millions or hundreds of millions of years away. Um, and this is completely incorrect. We actually live in a very hazardous cosmic environment and a great many responsible astronomers are drawing attention to this and drawing attention in particular to what's called the the torrid meteor stream which is this huge meteor stream 30 million kilometers wide that is the debris trail of the comet that hit us 
not once, but twice, 12,800 years ago, 11,600 years ago. And as a matter of fact, a bit of that debris trail of that comet hit the Earth much more recently in, on the 30th of June, 1908, the so-called Tunguska event. Mm. There was a little bit of rock from that original giant comet still circling in the Torrid meteor stream. Uh, and that uh, didn't even hit the Earth. It was about 100 meters in diameter. It exploded about five kilometers above the Earth's surface, but it flattened 80 million trees across an area of 2,000 square kilometers, which is about the size of the city of London. Uh, and if, if, yeah, I mean, if that had happened, oh, or a major center of urban population, rather than over, fortunately, an uninhabited area of Siberia in 1908. If that had happened over a major city, we would have had hundreds of thousands of casualties, and we would all be paying much more attention to the torrid meteor stream now. And the astronomers who are alarmed by the torrid meteor stream and alarmed by NASA's complacency have calculated that there's at least one object within the stream that is 30 kilometers wide and at least 100 objects in the stream that are more than one kilometer wide and they are all on Earth crossing orbits. It's like crossing a six lane highway twice a year with a blindfold on and just hoping that you don't meet any traffic or that if you do, it would be, you know, motorcycles rather than trucks. <laughs> but uh, this, is the, this is the gamble we're taking. And this is not a gloom and doom scenario. Maybe NASA are afraid of causing panic, but this is not a gloom and doom scenario. We have the technology now to sweep our immediate cosmic environment clean, to be sure that we don't face any uh, f further impacts that might turn us into the next lost civilization. But we're not making that choice. The, the money is being spent on other things, on the big military budgets and on vanity projects for, for, for NASA, which really I feel it's much more urgent to, to make sure that we have a future on this planet. And, and the technology exists. We can do it. It's just a matter of choice. Yeah, it is a frustrating situation. And I guess you know, this idea of uh, comet bombardment or a meteor impact in the past, it's been speculated about, but I guess the critics would always say, where are the craters? But now there's kind of an answer for that, right? Well, there's absolutely an answer for that. You see, the impacts, the primary impacts, were in areas that don't leave massive craters. And I'll explain this. However, craters are now being found. The primary impacts 12,800 years ago were on the North American ice cap. And the North, the, this was the Ice Age 12,800 years ago, and the North American ice cap was still a couple of miles deep at that time. It had thinned out over the previous 20,000 years or so, but it was still a couple of miles deep. And you have at least four objects in the range of half a mile to a mile in diameter coming in at 60,000 to 70,000 miles an hour and impacting the ice cap. The craters are excavated in the deep ice. They cause a massive melting of the ice cap and the craters effectively vanish. They're, they're, they're transient. They're, not, they're, 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 they're no longer in the ground. But what you get is shock effects under the ice. And those shock effects, now that all of the ice has gone, uh, as, as is the case today, can be measured on the ground. And in areas just outside the ice cap in the northeast of North America, four distinct craters have now emerged that date back exactly to 12,800 years ago. So, so the question of, of craters is in the process of being answered by the team of more than 30 scientists who are working on this problem, but their key evidence, and that evidence alone is good enough, is what are called impact proxies. These are the chemical products of a massive cosmic impact, which cannot be caused by anything else. And they include, for example, uh, nanodiamonds. Uh, these are tiny microscopic diamonds, which are created by the shock and heat of the impact. They include carbon spherules. Um, these are, um, again, a product of impacts. They include melt glass, exactly like trinitite, the melt glass that was created in nuclear explosions um, in, during nuclear tests. Uh, and and uh, they include evidence across actually 50 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface uh, of temperatures in excess of the boiling point of quartz, temperatures in excess of 2,200 degrees centigrade. And, the, and finally, they include a distinct layer of ash in the soil, which lies immediately over 
the remains of extinct species of animals. And this layer of ash is the result of continent-wide wildfires burning. You see, when these um, comet fragments come in so fast, so hot, superheated ejecta is thrown up into the upper atmosphere and then can fall hundreds of miles away from the impact site on the primal forests of that time. And so you're looking at con whole continents burning. And the evidence for this is very distinct in a distinct stratum in the soil. And as a matter of fact, it was exactly the same evidence that led to the recognition that the dinosaurs were made extinct 65 million years ago. Now, NASA is, and of course, we know the dinosaurs were made extinct by a cosmic impact. Now, NASA uh, is, of course, acknowledges that uh, a, a cosmic impact made the dinosaurs extinct, and it acknowledges the evidence for that. But up till now, it's ignoring the evidence for what happened 12,800 down to 11,600 years ago. And the other people who are ignoring that are historians and archaeologists, because weirdly, their story of civilization begins just after 11,600 years ago, but they're not taking account of the extinction level event that immediately preceded that. And we have to consider the possibility that those early signs of civilization are, in fact, a reinvention of civilization, a transfer of technology from the survivors of a lost civilization to hunter-gatherer peoples. Yeah, I think you make an excellent case for that. And I'm curious, with all this destruction and the heat coming in, do you think this could explain the sheets of sand glass in the deserts of the world that some researchers use to justify the idea of like an ancient nuclear war? Yeah, it could, it could well be related. This event was astonishingly widespread. As I said, the main impacts were on the North American ice cap, but the bits of the comet carried on across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, there were further impacts on the Northern European ice cap, and indeed there were impacts as far east as Syria. Now, there may have been impacts even beyond that in the 12,800 year ago event. Uh, the research is still being done, but it's clear we're looking at the fingerprint of a giant global cataclysm. It's fascinating to see these types of discoveries that just give us another piece of history for our planet. But outside of the destruction to the environment, how it was radically affected, how does this affect the story we've been told about humanity? Well, I think it, I think it affects it enormously. I, I, I just you know, slightly, slightly touched on that. You see, historians and archaeologists over the last hundred years or so have, have pieced together what they regard as a timeline of history. Right. Uh, and that timeline shows a straightforward evolutionary progress of the story of civilization from, you know, primitive cavemen, uh, anatomically modern humans like ourselves, by the way, have been around for at least 200,000 years. And right there, we should have a question. Why did we wait 195,000 years to develop the first civilizations? Right. Isn't it possible that people exactly like us made civilization much earlier, but that that civilization was was in some way wiped from the record. At any rate, here's this nice timeline of archaeology, which sees the, the cavemen who were entirely hunter-gatherers, the Stone Age, the Stone Age, it's called the Paleolithic. They were entirely nomadic hunter-gatherers. This is the mainstream story. Uh, and around 11,600 years ago, weirdly, they suddenly started to develop agriculture. And then there was a slow, slow build up from there. And about 6,000 to 5,500 years ago, we begin to see the first megalithic sites, sites that are built with gigantic megaliths. And then about the same period, the first cities are built. And then we move onwards from there in a smooth progress right through to smart old us sitting here in the 21st century with our technology. And we are, see ourselves as the apex and the pinnacle uh, of, of uh, all of the human story. But the problem is that that nice, comfortable, reassuring model has been built without taking account of the extinction level event that we now took, know, that we now know took place in the foundations of history. So I would say the house of history may be very well built for the last eight or 9,000 years, but it stands on foundations of sand. And we all know what happens to houses that are built on foundations of sand. <laughs> Archaeology has to take account of this cataclysmic event between 12,800 years ago and 11,600 years ago and build it into its model of civilization, of the origins of civilization, or we'll never be getting the straight story. Amen, man. I totally agree. And I think this is just, uh, it's so great to just see all this stuff kind of coming to light. And I guess one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle is Gobekli Tepe. Why is this so important to this new paradigm? 
Yes, it's it's of absolutely crucial importance. And this is Gobekli Tepe, a, a site in Turkey, in southeastern Turkey, in Anatolia, uh, which wasn't discovered until the second half of the 1990s. The reason it wasn't discovered, by the way, Gobekli Tepe in the Turkish language means pot-bellied hill. Uh, and that pot-bellied hill, it looks a bit like a pot-bellied hill hmm. that sits over the entire site, is absolutely 100% artificial. It was all put there by human beings. Teams of people, hundreds of them, with buckets filled with earth and rubble. They came and covered up the previously existing giant megalithic site that lies underneath that pot-bellied hill. They deliberately, systematically, carefully buried it. And it wasn't touched again for more than 10,000 years. The site flourished from 11,600 years ago, we now know, and that is the exact date for the second cataclysmic event that was accompanied by enormous global flooding. 11,600 years ago is the beginning of Gobekli Tepe. The site was used for about 1,000 years down to 10,600 or 10,400 years ago, and then whoever made it, whichever mysterious culture created this huge megalithic site, which, by the way, is 50 times bigger than Stonehenge and 7,000 years older than Stonehenge, whichever culture created this huge megalithic site then deliberately buried it like a time capsule, sealed it away. It wasn't touched again for more than 10,000 years until archaeologists rediscovered it in the second half of the 1990s and began to excavate it. And there, awaiting for them under the ground, was a colossal, inexplicable mystery. Uh, first of all, to understand a megalithic site, what megalith means big stones. Right. And what we're, what we're looking at is T-shaped limestone pillars that have been quarried out of the solid rock, and they form roughly the shape that we would recognize as the letter T. Actually, when you get closer to them, you realize that they're anthropomorphic, that they represent human forms, the, the, with the top of the T, the crossbar of the T, representing the head of the individual, and the upright pillar representing the body. And on many of these pillars are carved arms with hands, with long fingers, meeting in front of the belly uh, over a very distinct uh, kind of kind of belt and in fact many of the pillars at Gobekli Tepe are richly carved with amazing amazing works of art now the the problem is that according to the mainstream model of history you need a settled agricultural society which has produced surpluses for generations which has allowed people to become specialists they no longer have to go out and hunt a, and hunt, hunt and gather for their living, um, they can become specialized in various skills, including stonemasonry. Um, but this has typically been regarded as something that could only happen in societies that had already been practicing agriculture for a very long time. So when we see a site like Stonehenge in England, for example, which dates uh, back, according to the Orthodox story, to about 4,500 years ago. That's already in a fairly advanced Neolithic society where they have agriculture, they have the specialists, they have the organizational skills uh, to do something like this. But the mystery of Gobekli Tepe is that it just comes out of nowhere. Right. It, comes, it comes out of the blue. There's no background to it whatsoever. We see no evidence of evolution of these skills. And the, the society that archaeologists have been able to track in that region is entirely a hunter-gatherer society prior to this. And then suddenly we get this enormous megalithic site being created and it's very sophisticated. It contains, for example, the world's perfect, the world's first perfectly aligned north-south building. And to align a structure perfectly to north and south requires the use of accurate astronomy. We see many indications that astronomers were, were at work at Gobekli Tepe. So to cut a long story short, what archae archaeologists are scrambling to catch up with this right now, but to cut a long story short, the fairy tale that they are trying to spin uh, is that a hunter-gatherer population which had no prior experience of architecture at all, no prior experience of moving megaliths that weigh more than 20 tons, and in some cases up to 50 tons in weight, no prior experience of organizing a labor force uh, or of involving 
specialists like astronomers in the work, that this society suddenly wakes up one morning, uh, almost divinely equipped with all the knowledge, uh, magically equipped with all the knowledge and all the skills um, and, and, and all the necessary background to create the largest megalithic site that has ever been built on Earth. Uh, and at the same time, uh, just as, a, as an aside, they also decide to invent agriculture because it's exactly at that moment when Gobekli Tepe is created 11,600 years ago that we see agriculture suddenly spreading amongst the hunter-gatherers uh, of this region of Turkey. And to me, the archaeological fairy tale is, is quite absurd. It's obvious that what we're looking at is a transfer of technology from the survivors of a lost civilization who already knew how to work megalithic architecture and who already knew all about agriculture and who settled amongst the hunter-gatherers in Turkey and transferred their skills to them. They used Gobekli Tepe as a as a center of innovation. And what really drives this home is that this site pops up immediately after a global cataclysm on a scale that is absolutely capable of having wiped out almost all traces of a prior advanced civilization. Right, yeah, this new story is making a lot more sense. Now, in Armenia, we saw a couple of things like Karahunj and uh, the supposed buried pyramid there, which, you know, yes. Armenia and Turkey are geographical neighbors. Do you have any idea how these sites might fit into the story? Yes, I think Armenia fits very much into the story in lots and lots of ways. Uh, first of all, l let's take Karahunj. Um, Kara, Kara Hunj is, is an intriguing uh, situation in itself. Well, we saw it together, Greg, and there's these, these um, uh, amazing uh, alignments of megaliths flowing in an almost serpentine-like pattern uh, uh, across a plain surrounded by, by, by distant mountains. Um, and these megaliths, many of them have holes drilled through them. Um, and those those holes we we now know were used for astronomical observations, and the astronomical alignments that come out of them are very very old, going back into that twelve thousand year ago period. Um, and and secondly, recently just discovered by the way at, at the bottom of the Sicily Channel in the in the Mediterranean, and not that far are actually from Armenia, at a depth of more than 40 meters, more than 130 feet under the ocean, uh, marine archaeologists have come across something totally unexpected, which is a huge submerged megalithic site. And lo and behold, there's a megalith there, which is 36 feet long. Uh, and one of those, mega that, that, that 36 foot long megalith has holes drilled through it, exactly like the holes that we saw uh, in the Great Stone Circle at, at Karahunj. But in the case of the megalithic site at the bottom of the Sicily Channel, uh, we can be sure that it's vastly ancient because studies of sea level rise are very well advanced. And we know that that area has been covered by the sea for at least nine and a half thousand years, which means that the site that's sitting there must be much older than that. We don't know how much longer it stood there before the sea levels rose and covered it, but certainly it may have been there for a very long time. And that now makes sense in context of Gobekli Tepe, where we know the site is 11,600 years old. And I think what it's going to require us to do is to reconsider the dating of other megalithic sites around the world, including Karahunj. I mean, archaeologists really uh, suggest Karahunj might be, some of them say 3,000, some of them say 4,000 years old. Nobody really knows. The astronomical alignments and the nature of the site point to a much greater antiquity. And it, it's important to make something clear here, which is that the dating of megalithic sites is actually very difficult. You, there is no technique for directly dating when a stone monolith was cut and moved into position. What, what, because carbon dating doesn't do that. Carbon dating only dates organic material. Mm -hmm. So what archaeologists look for is a piece of bone, a, a piece of carbon, uh, a piece of charcoal, for example, that is so clearly and immediately associated with the stone they want to date that they can make the inference that the stone dates from the same period as the organic material. And this is very dangerous, uh, really, or or, or, or potentially very inaccurate, uh, because it's possible that later cultures wandering over a site, if this site is exposed, as many megalithic sites are, later cultures wandering over it introduce much younger organic material. And that organic material is what is dated, and it gives a falsely young 
date for the site. Now, this couldn't happen with Gobekli Tepe because Gobekli Tepe was deliberately buried more than 10,000 years ago and has been sealed since then. So there's no possibility of later organic material being introduced to it. And it can't happen with the site at the bottom of the Sicily Channel because it's 130 feet under the ocean now. Uh, so where we have sites that are... That, that, that are absolutely cut and dried, where there's no question over the dating, the Sicily, the Sicily Channel site and Gobekli Tepe, lo and behold, they t turn out to be vastly ancient and much more ancient than other megalithic sites around the world. So I think we have to consider the possibility that many megalithic sites, whether it's Stonehenge, whether it's uh, Manidra in uh, Malta, uh, for example, whether it's Karnak in Brittany, that many megalithic sites have actually been wrongly dated by archaeologists. I think these new discoveries are going to require a complete rethink of the age of megalithic sites all around the world. Mm, I agree. And, and our, the, the Armenian sites, sorry, I, I slightly went off your topic <laughs> no there, right? but... The Armenian sites are very much part of it. Karahunj is, is a fantastic site, and I would urge anybody who has the possibility to do so to go there and uh, take a look at it. Uh, and, and that pyramid that we saw near, near Devine is, is absolutely definitely a pyramid and uh, really intriguing and, and mysterious in its nature. But so little. Ar Armenia is a, is a very p poor country. They don't have uh, enormous resources. They've, they've been given a really bad deal by history over the years, the things that have happened to Armenia. Armenia and to Armenians in the last hundred years have been true, truly awful and, and the country is, is in a poor shape economically and they don't have the resources to do the archaeology. But I think if the archaeology were done, we would find that there is great antiquity uh, within, within Armenia. And let's not forget that the, the story of the flood, the worldwide story of the flood, only one telling of which is the story in the Bible, the story of Noah. Uh, but this is a story that's told all over the world. The biblical story of the flood has the survivors of the flood uh, turning up, settling, uh, coming to rest, if you like, on the mountains of Ararat. And, and Mount Ararat is the national symbol of Armenia. Uh, because of the Turkish ge genocide at the beginning of the 20th century, Armenia no longer has possession of Mount Ararat. It's now in Turkey and only a few days' walk from Gobekli Tepe. Um, but uh, the, the notion that this was a place of refuge for flood survivors that is carried by the Noah story in the Bible uh, and that it is associated associated with a land that was historically Armenia, but that is today Turkey, um, is a very intriguing one and one worth following up. I personally don't think that a physical ark was actually washed up on the waters of Mount Ararat mm -hmm. because the, the, the flooding that took place would never, in my view, have reached 16,000 feet above, sea, above present sea level. Um, but I do think that, that we're looking at a memory of the survivors of the global flood cataclysm who came to that area perhaps as a place of refuge and then began to pass on their skills to the local hunter-gatherers and we see the evidence for this in the archaeological record. I love that theory and there's a, a correlation I suppose with the Atlantis idea. It kind of fits with this time frame of the younger driest cataclysm, wouldn't you say? You're, you're spot on. Greg, you're absolutely right. And, and thank you for using the right, the right scientific name for this, because this is what this cataclysm is now being referred to as in the scientific literature, as the Younger Dryas Cataclysm. And that's because this episode of worldwide catastrophe between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago has long been recognized as a very mysterious episode. There was a sudden deep freeze. The, the world had been coming out uh, of the Ice Age and then temperatures suddenly plummeted to just appallingly freezingly cold uh, and a certain types of vegetation died out and other types emerged and, and, and that's actually what the reference to younger dry ass is. It's to a certain, the dry ass is a certain kind of Arctic uh, or Alpine flower. Um, but, but geologists call it the Younger Dryas. It's a 1,200-year period. It starts mysteriously 12,800 years ago with a massive fall in global temperatures, and it stops equally mysteriously 11,600 years ago with a massive rise in global temperatures. And both events at both ends are accompanied by global flooding. Well, the reason that the 11,600-year-ago date is significant is not, not only is this the date for the foundation of the deeply mysterious megalithic site of Gobekli Tepe, but also it is the date that the Greek philosopher Plato 
gives in his dialogues, the Timaeus and Critias dialogues, for the destruction and submergence beneath the waves of the lost advanced civilization of Atlantis. Boom. <laughs> yeah. You know, now, archaeologists, of course, have been busy dismissing the Atlantis story and claiming that Plato made it up uh, for a very long time. Our archaeologists don't like this story, and they, they use the word Atlantologist as an insult. If anybody believes in the possibility that something like Atlantis might have existed, archaeologists uh, treat them as though they're crazy. But here's the thing. Plato put an absolute date on the destruction of submergence and submergence of Atlantis. He said that it happened 9,000 years before the time of Solon. And Solon was a famed Greek lawmaker. Uh, he was, in fact, the ancestor of Plato himself. And Solon had lived in 600 BC. So 9,000 years time of Solon is 9,600 BC, which is 11,600 years ago, which is exactly the date for that second spike of cataclysm for what geologists call meltwater pulse 1b, a massive rise in sea levels 11,600 years ago. Uh, and and um, it's also the date for the foundation of Gobekli Tepe. So if Plato made it up, he was astonishingly on the money uh, with the latest science on what happened uh, in that period. Global sea level rise, uh, huge inundation of lands. That's exactly what he's, what he's describing. And the interesting thing is that he tells us that Solon, his ancestor, got the story on a visit to Egypt. Hmm. He was told the story by the priests of the Temple of Neith at uh, Sais in the Delta. That temple no longer exists today apart from a few stones. Uh, but the, as, as Solon reported the story and as it was passed down to Plato, it was those priests who informed him about the lost island continent of Atlantis, the lost civilization of Atlantis and its destruction by flood and fire uh, because uh, it had become arrogant and proud and, and cruel and it had ceased to wear its prosperity with moderation. In, in Plato's account, uh, this was something that the universe took objection to. Uh, and that's why Atlantis was, if you like, uh, put in its place. Hmm. Uh, and, and we can listen to that and, and, and think about it and perhaps wonder how many of the boxes of the next lost civilization we ourselves tick, uh, because hmm. Western technological society indeed does not bear its prosperity with moderation and has indeed become arrogant and cruel and unloving and unnurturing to spirit. Right. There's definitely some lessons there for sure. Talk to us about the island of Ka. This is an interesting story that I learned about from your book, and it kind of relates to the bigger picture and, and has a lot of parallels to kind of this, this picture you're painting, right? Well, yes, it does. Uh, and this is a, this is a story that uh, has survived in the ancient Egyptian annals. You see, when Egyptologists respond to Plato's story of Atlantis, they like to point out that there is no use of the word Atlantis in any ancient Egyptian text. And that is absolutely true. Uh, you will not find the word Atlantis in any genuine ancient Egyptian text. But what you do find is a massive amount of references to an island homeland of an advanced civilization. It's called the homeland of the primeval ones. And it's made clear that they were navigators and sailors, that they had advanced and sophisticated skills far ahead of those of the rest of the people in the world at that time. And this story is told in, in what are called the Edfu building texts, which are carved deeply into the walls of the Temple of Horus at Edfu, uh, in Upper Egypt. Now, the Temple of Horus at Edfu is itself not that old a temple. That temple dates to about 300 BC, about 2,300 years ago. But it stands on the site of much earlier temples, which recede back uh, one after another, being rebuilt on the same site, which recede back into the, the pre-dynastic era. And what it turns out is that the priests of the then newly built Temple of Horus at Edfu, built on that same site 2,300 years ago, they, in they inherited the archives of the earlier temples. And those archives uh, included material that was written, they say, on animal skins, and that was so fragile so much crumbling and falling apart, some of it already lost, that the priests of the Temple of Horus at Edfu decided to preserve it 
permanently. Uh, and they took extracts from those texts, and that's what they copied onto the walls of the temple, deeply inscribing them. And these are the Edfu building texts. And they tell of the destruction by fire, by a cosmic event, by, 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 by a, something that's described as a great serpent that leaps out of the sky and strikes the island and, and splits it and forces it to be submerged beneath the waves. Uh, they tell how there were survivors of this cataclysm because some of the quote-unquote gods were at sea at the time, and they tell how those gods navigated their way back to the location of their former island and found it vanished entirely beneath the waves and the sea there completely filled with mud. And this is a direct echo of Plato's story because he tells us exactly the same thing, that when Atlantis went down and vanished forever, the sea where it had stood was filled with so much mud that navigation uh, became became difficult. So there is the story. The story of Atlantis is told in, in ancient Egypt. It's just not called uh, Atlantis. And then we learn that those survivors of the primeval island of the gods, uh, that those survivors uh, wander the world. There's a very evocative phrase in, in the ancient Egyptian language about their wanderings and how they go to other lands. And their mission is to reconstitute or reincarnate, uh, reinvent, if you like, uh, their former civilization. And Egypt is one of the places that they do that. And there they build what are referred to as primeval mounds. And these primeval mounds are to serve as the sites for all future temples and pyramids in Egypt. They're a kind of blueprint that is laid out on the ground at that time. And I would suggest another place that they went was Turkey, Mount Ararat, the lands around Mount Ararat. Uh, and we see their fingerprints uh, in the mysterious site of Gobekli Tepe. Uh, and I think they also went to many other countries. I think, think we find their traces in Mexico. Uh, I think we find their traces in South America, in the Andes, particularly in a place like Tiwanaku uh, in Bolivia. We find their traces in all kinds of mysterious science that has survived the ages and that is of vast antiquity. Indeed, all around the world, the evidence is staring us in the face. But mainstream archaeology, by being so deeply wedded to the existing paradigm, is finding it very difficult to see this evidence, very difficult to understand it. it it's often the case with science that, that when new evidence comes in that completely contradicts the existing paradigm, rather than changing the paradigm, those who are attached to the paradigm hold on to it like grim death. <laughs> and it can often take a century or two for the old paradigm uh, finally to be dismissed. And I think we're in that moment of paradigm shift in our understanding of the origins of civilization uh, right now. Right. I agree with you. And I love those stories of cedars of knowledge. I mean, they are just as widespread as the flood myths. Yes. I mean, from Native American cultures to Samaria to the Vedic text, it's a major theme in the oral traditions around the globe. And these are really the stories that the ancient aliens camp clings to. Yes. And other camps, like uh, even more fringe things like the hollow earth, they talk about beings coming from inside. Mm -hmm. But I think all this new evidence, you know, it, it really brings the story down to earth. You really don't need all that other stuff when you consider the idea of an advanced people. You could think about uh, if, if today 99% of civilization was destroyed and a couple of New Yorkers made their way to a habitable remote area in Africa, they might start trying to explain things like Wall Street and McDonald's while trying to corral people into some kind of civilization. You, you can see how that could happen. Exactly. You can, you can see exactly how that could happen. And, and for me, uh, a lost human civilization is the, the simplest and most elegant explanation for all of the uh, uh, anomalies. I, I have nothing against aliens, by the way. I mean, I, I've, I, I think that the universe we live in is deeply mysterious, and I'm f quite certain that it's full of intelligent life. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, do we see the fingerprints of intelligent aliens who have crossed into stellar space? Do we see those fingerprints in ancient and, and mysterious archaeological sites around the world? And I, I don't see them. I, I, it's been my privilege to spend 25 years exploring just about every intriguing and extraordinary ancient site in the world. And so far, I haven't seen anything that could only have been made by uh, an alien culture that had the technology to cross into stellar space. Right. And it, an example I often give is that the, you know, the Great Pyramid um, is an incredible monument, and, and it's often attributed to, to aliens by the ancient astronaut lobby. But, but actually, the Great Pyramid is, is almost perfectly, but not quite perfectly, aligned to true north. It's three 
sixtieths of a single degree off true north. The sides of the Great Pyramid are almost exactly the same, but there are variations of up to seven inches in the side lengths. In other words, there is error in the Great Pyramid. And I think if you have the technology to cross interstellar space and navigate your way to this little blue dot of planet Earth, uh, and you somehow want to build a pyramid or uh, involve the local population in building a pyramid, you would be sure uh, that you would get your alignment to true north right, and you would be sure that you would get the side lengths of your monument absolutely right. So I think we're looking at absolute evidence of, of uh, human error uh, in the construction of the Great Pyramid. Nevertheless, it's incredible. It's an incredible piece of work. This is a, a monument with a 13 acre footprint. It weighs 6 million tons. It's 481 feet high. To align it to just within three sixtieths of a single degree of true north is astonishing and uncanny precision. Yeah. And I would say that it speaks of human abilities and, and uh, the skills and knowledge of a lost civilization. Yeah, you very well may be right. Another thing I wanted to ask about was this, uh, this handbag symbol, a, a related image that we see across way too many supposedly unrelated cultures. When did you start to recognize this? It goes back uh, quite a while. I'm not the only person who's, who's uh, spotted this. Quite a, quite a number of us have been intrigued by this mystery over the last uh, few years. It, it first really grabbed my attention when my wife, Santa, who you know, is a, is a photographer, and Santa and I worked together. Uh, and we did many journeys in, in Mexico, uh, particularly back when I was researching fingerprints of the gods in the early 1990s. Um, and one of the sites we visited is a place called La Venta on the Gulf of Mexico, which is attributed to a very interesting culture called the Olmecs. Uh, actually, we don't know what they called themselves. That's what archaeologists call them, uh, who were the predecessors of the Maya. And actually, everything the Maya knew and passed on had come down to them from the Olmecs, including the Mayan calendar, which is itself an, an astonishing technological uh, device. The, the Mayan calendar, by the way, inherited from the Olmecs, um, is, gives us a more accurate length of the solar year than we using in our uh, scientific society today. And within the Mayan calendar, there are devices that will enable you to accurately predict eclipses of the moon and when they will fall 200,000 years into the future, or to accurately say when they happened 200,000 years in the past. So this line of transmission through the Olmecs to the Maya in the Mayan calendar has preserved a scientific artifact. But there at the site of La Venta, this so-called Olmec site on the Gulf of Mexico, uh, where Doug up by archaeologists in the 1920s through the 1940s, some astonishing physical remains, the, the, the so-called Olmec heads, which are these gigantic, almost spherical um, megaliths that have been carved into human features. And these features are anomalous in themselves because they, they clearly do not look like the indigenous peoples of Mexico. They look like Africans, as a matter of fact, or perhaps Polynesians. The features are, are certainly not uh, those of Native American Indians. But alongside them were also discovered images of individuals who look like Caucasians with very rich and prominent beards. And, and uh, Native American peoples don't normally grow, you know, very large, prominent beards like this. They don't, they don't have the facial hair right. for, for that. So this is puzzling. But then amongst these artifacts is the earliest carved on a huge stone slab, is the earliest surviving representation of the god Quetzalcoatl, which means the feathered serpent, who was remembered remembered as a great civilization bringer in a time of darkness. He brings the gifts of civilization to the peoples of Mexico. And lo and behold, enshrined within the coils of the feathered serpent sits a man and he's holding a very definite kind of bag in his hand. And he's holding it in a very distinct way with the fingers visible. Now, I just filed that away. I didn't, I didn't notice the bag symbolism when I first wrote about La Venta back in uh, 1995 with fingerprints of the gods. But then, much later on, as I'm researching Magicians of the Gods, the, the sequel to Fingerprints that I've now published, much later on, I go to Gobekli Tepe, and I see in enclosure D, there are a number of distinct enclosures there, I see what is called Pillar 43 by the German Archaeological Institute who've done the excavation. And on Pillar 43, on the top of it, as well as a, an astonishing uh, image that, uh, that, that I argue in the new book represents constellations and indeed shows us the sky in our time, uh, on, to on top of that pillar are three of these exact same bags. 
Um, and then we find the, then there we know they're 11,600 years old. We can be sure of that. And then again, we find the exact same bags in ancient Sumer in Mesopotamia associated with another civilizer whose name was U Uana Dapa or Oanis, who uh, came with seven sages, the seven Apkalu, who are described as magicians. Indeed, this is I call the book Magicians of the Gods. And images of them, they're also holding the same, well, I call it jokingly, a, a man bag. <laughs> they're also holding the same, the same man bag. So in these three widely separated cultures, supposedly of different uh, epochs of history, we find the same, the same symbolism cropping up uh, associated with the same story, that this is about the bringing of, uh, of civilization, of reseeding civilization again, uh, after a, a great cataclysm. And I, I think that the, this is yet more evidence of the worldwide distribution of the survivors of the Younger Dryas cataclysm. Mm, I love it, man. It's really intriguing. It almost seems like the symbol of some ancient altruistic secret society. It does. That's what it seems like to me. Like, you know, if you were carrying one of those bags, then other people would know who you were. Right. Uh, it's like a secret, like a secret handshake or, or something <laughs> like that. Now, now, what was in those bags? We can't know. We can, uh, we can only speculate. But the, 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 the symbol is enormously widespread and, and mysteriously interconnected all around the world. That's a fact. Yeah. And you mentioned this Pillar 43 and Enclosure D at Gobekli Tepe. And it is a major part of this new book. And uh, a big part of that is decoding what might be a message there. And this also relates to why it's referred to as a time capsule. What do you think is behind that message? Okay. Well, first of all, there's one other thing I need to say about Gobekli Tepe, which is that the site, as it has so far been excavated, is only a tiny proportion of the whole site. What, what we're seeing exposed by archaeologists since the mid-1990s um, is, is just a fraction of it. They've been over the whole site with ground-penetrating radar now, and they know that more than 50 times as much still lies under the ground. That's why I say that this site, which is 7,000 years older than Stonehenge, is also 50 times larger than Stonehenge, because the existing exposed area of the site um, is uh, is already the size of Stonehenge, and underground awaiting to be excavated is so much more, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gigantic megalithic pillars still lie buried. So the full message of this time capsule may well remain to be revealed, but we have the intriguing hint given, on, given to us on uh, Pillar 43 in Enclosure D, now, listeners would really need to go to the book to see the full argument and to see the photographs and to see the, 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 the case that, that I'm making here, which, by the way, is based, and I want to pay tribute to Paul Burley, uh, an, an engineer and, and an, an architect who was the original proposer of this idea and whose, whose work I reference uh, in Magicians of the Gods. But there's a certain area of the sky uh, which is divided by the Milky Way. Now, the Milky Way is our home galaxy, and the center of the Milky Way incorporates what's called a dark rift. It's, it's caused by nebulae, uh, a cloudy nebulae in the heart of the Milky Way, and it looks like a dark gap in the middle of the Milky Way. And that dark gap was of great importance to many ancient cultures, particularly the ancient Maya, who saw it as the womb of creation, as the cosmic womb of rebirth, very symbolically important to them. And on either side of that dark rift at the heart of the Milky Way stand two constellations. One of those is the constellation that we call Sagittarius today, and the other is the constellation that we call Scorpio. And it is this area of the sky, uh, I'm convinced, building on the work of Paul Burley, it is this area of the sky that is imaged on Pillar 43. And what's really intriguing is that in that imagery, the sun is shown sitting directly over the dark rift. And here I need to pay tribute to another researcher who's John Major Jenkins, a great friend of mine and one of the leading researchers on the ancient Mayan calendar. And what John Major Jenkins has been showing us for, for years, actually, is that that date of the 21st of December 2012 that we all got so worked up about a few years ago, uh, with, and, uh, which was wrongly suggested to be the date of the end of the world by many ill-informed commentators, it isn't a specific moment. It's actually a window in time. 
And that window is about 80 years wide. And it, it extends from 1960, roughly, to 2040. And it's when the sun sits astride the dark rift at the center of the galaxy, as viewed from Earth, between the constellations of Sagittarius and Scorpio, on the winter solstice, hmm. the 21st of December. And that only happens in our epoch. That's what happens today. That's what the Mayan calendar was really built on. They were tracking the gradual motion of the sun. You see, that I, I have to explain the background to this. The Earth is the viewing platform from which we observe the stars. Mm -hmm. There is a wobble on the axis of the Earth. It's a slow, cyclical, 26,000-year wobble called the precession of the axis of the Earth. And because the Earth is our viewing platform, this change of orientation uh, of the Earth in space changes the rising times of particular stars and uh, all celestial bodies and changes the appearance of the stars in the sky in a very regular pattern at the rate of one degree every 72 years. It's hard to observe, but if you keep records long enough and you're scientifically minded, you can observe it. Uh, and this is, this is the knowledge that is incorporated into the ancient Mayan calendar, and it was based on the processional changes in the position of the sun against the background of the stars on the winter solstice. And it is that exact moment that is depicted in great detail on Pillar 43 at Gobekli Tepe. This tells us, if I'm right, and readers must make up their own mind from the evidence I present in the book, uh, this tells us that whoever created Gobekli Tepe had advanced scientific knowledge of the phenomenon of precession and were able to simulate future skies the changes that would take place. Uh, and, and, and secondly, uh, it tells us that they wanted somebody to pay attention to the sky of our time. Indeed, it is very much the same message as the Mayan calendar. It's watch the sky during this window of 80 years between the, the, the decades that we call the 1960s and the 2040s in our epoch. Wow, man. If you're somebody who puts any stock in synchronicity or some sort of poetic unfolding of events, how coincidental is it that this very pillar would be unearthed and decoded in the very era it's referencing rather than any other time before or after? That's interesting. I, I, I agree with you. It's a very it's a very odd it's a very odd thing that this should that this should happen. And and something odder about it. Uh, you know, Gobekli Tepe was um noticed by archaeologists in the very early nineteen fifties, which perhaps coincidentally is just before that window in time opens. Um American archaeologists visited the site uh, in very early 1950s, they were looking for Stone Age remnants and they found some flints on the ground. But then sticking up out of the soil of that pot-bellied hill, they saw the tops of a couple of beautifully carved pillars. And their immediate conclusion, because of their prejudices, because of their preconceptions, were that those pillars were recent, that they must be looking at a Byzantine cemetery. And, and for that reason, they abandoned the site and never excavated it further. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, the, the second half of the 1990s when Klaus Schmidt of the German Archaeological Institute took another look at the site that he realized that actually they were vastly uh, remotely ancient. And, and coincidentally, Klaus, Klaus Schmidt's discovery or, or rediscovery of the site in the second half of the 1990s is within the window of time that is indicated on on pillar 43 um you know i don't do spooky often but this stuff does give me goosebumps uh, every now and then uh, and and you know the, the the reason why there's just so much more background that we don't have time to go into here but i do set out my stall you know very clearly in the book and and every statement of fact is footnoted and referenced so that people can follow it up and see where i get my information from yeah, it is a great case, a really lengthy, detailed case in the book, and I love it. I, I'm curious, I mean, I, I don't know how much it is in our nature to consider future generations in such a way, but, you know, they might have had a, a way different mindset. I mean, they seemed way more concerned with the earth and the people on it than we do today. Well, yes, I think so. And they had, and let's not forget that, that they had passed through a, a horrendous global cataclysm, which had brought their civilization down. They'd been taught a powerful lesson by the universe, uh, a, a lesson in humility, as a matter of fact. And, and I think it's that lesson that they thought, uh, that they sought to transmit uh, to the future and that they did so with great care. Another slight 
slightly spooky point. And again, you know, we cannot say that these are facts, uh, but, but every ancient civilization we know of worth its salt uh, believed absolutely in reincarnation. Every ancient civilization, amongst them the ancient Egyptians. And they therefore believed that those who live on Earth would come back at some time in the future. So maybe, maybe, and I'm wildly speculating here, <laughs> maybe Pillar 43 was a message from the people of that time to their future selves today, or maybe that's how they saw it at any rate, even if that was not actually the case. Damn, <laughs> that's trippy. Man, well, I know we're getting to the end of the line here. It is a busy day for you, but Magicians is a fascinating book and presents some great evidence that the past is not what we've been led to believe it is. And uh, before we go, do you want to remind people where they can get the book and uh, your website, things like that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Greg. The place to go is my website, which is www.grahamhancock.com dot com um, and and uh, there's a special page dedicated to magicians of the gods there and there are links to go purchase it if you want to do that um, it was published in america on the 10th of november it was published in the UK uh, on the 10th of September. It's coming out in Canada uh, very shortly. Uh, and, and I hope that this is, this I know for sure, is the first major work that has considered the implications of that cataclysm between 12,800 years ago and 11,600 years ago has considered the implications of that cataclysm for the stories we tell ourselves about our past. And we should never forget that history is a narrative. And I believe that this new evidence is not me. I'm simply the vehicle that brings, that puts this evidence before the public. It's the evidence itself that matters. And that evidence is a game changer. We are going to have to change everything we have thought about the origins of human civilization. And in so doing, vast new avenues of inquiry open up that can teach us so much about ourselves and what we're doing here on this planet. Well said, man. And that was great. We covered a whole lot of ground there. Thanks so much for being here, man. I had a blast hanging out in Armenia. Definitely a life-changing trip. Uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime after the holidays and talk about more of the interesting things that you've gotten into, psychedelics and all that. Greg, you have an absolute commitment from me. <laughs> I am looking forward to having a, a, a much longer discussion with you, hopefully in January.